The topic for discussion today is enteric fever. Enteric fever constitutes of typhoid and paratyphoid fevers which is most commonly caused by salmonella. Salmonella typhi causes typhoid fever and salmonella paratyphi A, B and C causes paratyphoid fever. Enteric fever is one of the important causes of fevers that occur in India, sub-Saharan countries and Latin America and in other countries it is relatively rare. The most common uh, host is humans and is, it is exclusively found in humans only and the mode of transmission is fecal oral route. This occurs by contaminated food and water which, uh, where the bacilli will travel from various uh, vectors such as flies, house flies and uh, uh, un uh, unproperly washed hands, fields and contaminated water. These bacilli enter via these through routes through food and the next person will be infected by taking that contaminated food or water and in turn this uh, person who has been infected with the salmonella bacilli will again pa uh, pass this uh, bacilli within the stools and water and the uh, cycle continues the, in the process of transmission. Coming to idiopathogenesis, this bacilli which enters through the contaminated food and water will enter the small intestine and at the ileal tract, especially at the payas patches, these bacilli attacks the lymphoid aggregates in the payas patches. There, they develop and they uh, multiply in number and they cause swelling of the payas patches which, which in turn they will cause ulcerations and also perforation in the complicated cases. At this stage of multi multiplication, the bacilli there enters into the bloodstream causing bacteremia. At this stage, in the case of severe bacteremia, this bacilli can enter into various organs such as liver, the uh, liver, kidneys and the other uh, lymphoid aggregates and also the reticular endothelial system. Here they again give rise to various systemic manifestations. The normal incubation period for the enteric fever is about 10 to 14 days and sometimes it may last for a longer period of time. And, and sometimes the progression is also very insidious that is it is slow in nature and to identify that it is an enteric fever or typhoid fever probably it takes about one week after the initiation of the fever. After attacking various systems, usually the typhoid gives rise to various clinical manifestations. In that, high temperature is one of the clinical signs with a characteristic step ladder pyrexia which will last for about 4 to 5 days. Patient will also exhibit other symptoms such as malice, drowsiness, headache, aching of the limbs that is myalgia and patient may have persistent cough and also epistaxis sometimes. Another characteristic feature which usually appears at the end of the first week is rose red spots which are seen usually in the upper abdomen region and the trunk and sometimes at the nape of the neck and the back. Here these rose red spots usually fade on applying pressure and these usually last for about few days and these are most predominantly seen or mostly they are uh, easily identifiable on patients with white skin. After this at the end of the first week and while patient is entering into the second week patient will also have splenomegaly which is enlargement of the spleen. At this stage patient will also have constipations. Constipation due to enlargement of the ileocecal junction because of swelling of the lymphoid aggregates. This is because the bacilli attack these lymphoid aggregates and there because of they multiply and result in the swelling of this region. However, in children who are attacked with the typhoid or paratyphoid fevers, they exhibit diarrhea. They have a characteristic diarrhea called as P. supi diarrhea. Patient also exhibits with hepatomegaly at the end of the second week. However, if at all patient is not identified with typhoid fever or if it is not treated properly within these two weeks, they may land up into various severe complications such as hemorrhage of the uh, payas patches or there can be perforation. And if, if at all this bacilli enters into the bone, then they will have arthritis and osteomyelitis. They can also, if, they, if it involves a heart, it can also lead to my, uh, myocarditis and meningitis in case of severe, uh, severe manifestation is meningitis. Have, and patients in this condition will have severe abdominal pain because of abdominal distension and as I already told they will have severe cough leading to bronchitis also. About 5% I mean after this 2 weeks of period if patient is properly treated then the disease comes to a normal stage. But sometimes or most of the times what happens is 5% of the patients remain as chronic carriers for this salmonella typhi where 
the bacilli still will be present within the gallbladder for about three to six months of time and patient will be in infectious stage even after treatment for about one year. In this, in this condition, patient will have the capacity to still infect other patients because of this uh, excretion of bacilli within the stools and urine. Other clinical variants include pneumotyphoid, renal typhoid and meningotyphoid. This is based upon the organ that is infected or the organ that is attacked by the bacteremia condition. And next uh, type of enteric fever is paratyphoid fever. It is usually caused by Salmonella paratyphi A, B or C variants whereas Salmonella paratyphi B is the common variant. It is usually a shorter or milder in course than the typhoid fever but it, uh, it attacks very abruptly. Hence there can be a condition called as acute enteritis. Here we can see abundant rashes of rose red spots. However, intestinal complications in paratyphoid fever are uh, relatively rare when compared to that of uh, typhoid fever. Coming to various complications, as I already discussed, there will be hemorrhage, perforation of Peyer's patches, cholecystitis, pneumonia, arthritis, osteomyelitis, meningitis and myocarditis in severe untreated cases. So, how to identify this? Typhoid fever. Apart from clinical features, there are various other investigations that can be, do, can, can be done to identify this typhoid fever. They include WBC count is one of the uh, uh, marker for identifying typhoid fever where patient will show persistent leukopenia that is decrease in WBC count. Blood culture is a gold standard for identifying typhoid fever. Stool examination also helps in identifying the uh, bacilli that is the culture of the bacilli and the culture of this bacilli can also be done using a single rectal swab or identifying them in CSF, peritoneal fluid, lymph nodes and urine. However, in urine it is less predominantly seen when compared to the fecal material. If at all bacilli is present in the CSF, it denotes meningitis, typhoid, typhoidal meningitis in case of uh, bacilli within the CSF. Other very commonly used test that is routinely done investigation in identifying typhoid is Vidal test. This Vidal test helps in measuring the antibodies that is antibody H and antibody O for Salmonella typhi and paratyphi. The method for doing this is there are, about two, there are two different uh, tubes which are used for identifying this typhoid which is Dryer's tube and the Felix tube. This Dryer's tube helps in identifying H antibody whereas the Felix tube helps in identifying O antibody. In Dryer's tube, to identify this H antibody, there are certain antigen sera which is pre-manufactured which is uh, antigen H and antigen O. For identifying antigen O, this antigen that will take four different tubes that is four, two tubes for H and O where H antigen is added into the one of the tube. If at all there is a H antibody present within the tube, they will have agglutination that is clumps formation which will be like cotton woolly clumps. If at all there is O antibody present then it reacts with the O antigen that has been dropped into the tube which will result in disc like pattern. It is uh, however Vida test is like not very reliable test but it is the presently available test which is routinely used in case of identifying this typhoid and paratyphoid. By this uh, both H antigen and H antibody or O antigen and O antibody are done by a process called serial dilutions and uh, where equal volumes of serial dilutions will occur and the results are read based upon the ratio of these dilutions. Uh, whenever there is a high anti-O, it denotes acute infection. Whenever there is high anti antibody H, then it will, uh, it will denote uh, which type of fever it is, whether it is a typhoid fever or a paratyphoid fever. Coming to management of this typhoid and paratyphoid, first is symptomatic fever uh, treatment. Apart from that, fluoroquinolones, which is ciprofloxacin, is a drug of choice, especially if at all this Salmonella bacilli is, uh, uh, the Salmonella bacilli can be identified or it is uh, not resistant to the treatment. But unfortunately, most of the cases, most of the in most of the cases, the back, the Salmonella bacilli is resistant. Hence, there are other modes of treatment that is available, which includes chlorotrimoxazole, ampicillin, amoxicillin 750 milligrams four times daily, chloramphenicol, which is 500 milligrams four times daily, has to be given. In case of chronic carriers, same 
Treatment can be continued with, for example, with ciprofloxacin, but it has to be continued for a four weeks period. Other preventive measures that can be taken includes uh, maintenance of good sanitation. Always cover the food with, with the help of lids and do not leave any food uncovered. Second thing, maintenance of uh, surroundings where uh, 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 we should make sure that there are no flies uh, or any dust or garbage that is left uh, without any cover or just left without unattending. Second thing is, there are many vaccines that are available. Those are typhoid vaccines to uh, prevent, I mean to give immunity and to prevent uh, further typhoid attacks. For example, oral uh, oral typhoid vaccines are available, which is one, of, one among them is a live attenuated vaccine, which second one is, which is an injectable one, uh, which is inactivated uh, vaccines are also available. Other vaccines which are available are monovalent, bivalent, anti-typhoid vaccines, TAB vaccine, which, which means Typhoid, paratyphoid A and paratyphoid B vaccine and typhoral vaccines. Topic for discussion is herpes simplex virus. Uh, herpes simplex virus is one of the common cause of uh, uh, recurrent mucocutaneous lesions that are occurring in the head and neck region, trunk and the genital region. It is one of the eight viruses of herpes viride family uh, where HSV1 and HSV2 belong to human herpes virus 1 and human herpes virus 2 uh, groups. Coming and uh, this herpes simplex virus is most commonly seen in children but usually takes a lesser aggressive form and most of the times it is asymptomatic and when this infection occurs in an adults, especially in immune compromised patients, it takes a very aggressive phase. In immune compromised patients such as in HIV uh, patients or AIDS patients, the, the role, the HSV takes a serious and often fatal phase. Phase. There are two strains of HSV which is HSV1 and HSV2 that is herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2. Usually this herpes simplex virus 1, HSV1 uh, attacks the upper abdominal region, head and neck region, oral region, eyes and the upper abdomen region. Whereas HSV2 is predominantly affecting the genitalia region. However, HSV2 is nowadays found in, uh, uh, in the upper abdominal region especially in the oral and head and neck regions also. The most, as uh, common, already told, the common sites of uh, infection is oral cavity, genitalia and eye. HSV induced keratitis of eye is one of the most common causes of blindness in the world. Coming to the virus structure of HSV, it is usually a uh, well circumscribed, I mean enveloped virus. It is a DNA virus uh, with present within a icosahedral core. With the outer, outer uh, layer is made up of lipid and it has numerous glycoproteins that are emanating from this outer lipid layer and these are called as ENV proteins. They are usually obtained from the host cell membrane. Coming to the pathogenesis, uh, herpes virus is usually manifested or it is usually transmitted by uh, direct contact with the uh, lesions of the her herpes HSV infected patient. And secondly, it is also by the secretions uh, that have been uh, secreted by the lesions. And third thing is, they are also by a airborne infection. This herpes virus, when it has been uh, infected from a person who has already been uh, infected with this virus, it is inoculated onto the mucocutaneous region and the primary lesion forms at the site of inoculation. At the site of inoculation, there will be vesicle formation which later burst to form into an ulcer. During this stage of primary infection, the virus travels along the sensory neural axon and then it remains a latent within the ganglion, for example trigeminal ganglion and it establishes a chronic or latent infection within that region. In course of time, that is uh, at, the, at, the, at a stage where an immune compromisation occurs, then this virus reactivates again giving rise to a secondary or recrudescent HSV infection at the site of this uh, the neural ganglion. Other than the neural uh, latency they also have an extra neural latency that is this in this extra neuronal latency the virus will attack the epithelial cells at the site of inoculation and they remain latent within these epithelial cells and at the uh, at, at further stages where there is an immune compromisation phase occurs then they again reactivate giving rise to secondary infection. Here one important thing is that as the herpes simplex virus has this uh, 
affinity towards the neuronal cells and also towards the epithelial cells and they reside within this epithelial and the neuronal cells they are also called as neurotrophic or epitheliotrophic virus and the phase of hsv replication is also very fast and there will be outnumbered hsv viruses within the blood Coming to HSV-1, that is herpes simplex virus 1, it is usually a ubiquitous virus, that is, uh, it is present, omnipresent, it is present everywhere. And when the, most of the people uh, across the world, about 30 to 100% zero positivity is seen in case of HSV-1. And the, as already told, these lesions are usually seen above the waist or the abdominal region and most commonly seen in oral lesions. I mean, most commonly seen lesions are in, within the oral cavity. And there are certain other uh, uh, particular lesions that occur with, uh, with this HSV, which includes one of them is herpes bitlow, where uh, patients or any, any patient who is in direct contact with already infected HSV person, the fingers are, are affected, giving rise to vesicles and paronychia condition, which is called as herpes bitlow. Earlier, this herpes bitlow was most commonly seen in healthcare workers, especially dentists, but later, because of usage of uh, because of increased awareness in usage of uh, protective gloves, herpes vitlo has been uh, I mean it has been reduced in its prevalence. Next is herpes gladiatora. As a term itself tells, it is most commonly seen in wrestlers. A person, uh, a normal person who has been uh, fighting or wrestling with a person who is already affected with uh, herpes simplex, the virus gets inoculated onto his the onto his trunk or other regions of the body wherever he is touched by the infected person. So this is called as herpes gladiatorum which was most commonly seen in case of Brazilus. Later, in, in severe cases where herpes uh, involves other systemic organs too, it gives rise to other complications such as HSV encephalitis, HSV pneumonia, HSV esophagitis, neonatal and disseminated infections. Neonatal HSV is usually seen in uh, when the mother is being infected during her term and the child uh, gets the HSV by direct contact. During this phase, in children, and especially at the neonatal age, as the immunity is not well developed, they may have very full, uh, severe or full-blown HSV vesicles and in case of eczema, this HSV, along with the eczema, there will be more severe form of a HSV uh, infections. It is also associated with erythema multiforme and in Bell's palsy, about 30% of Bell's palsy cases, etiopathogenesis is related to HSV infection. Coming to the clinical features, the HSV infection manifests in three variants of uh, three different variants, which includes primary infection, recurrent or recrudescent or secondary infection, and third thing is in immune compromised patients. Coming to primary infection, usually it manifests at, uh, at the site of inoculation. It is the primary infection that has been uh, uh, manifested by the patient. So the various clinical features it uh, gives is like gingival stomatitis, pharyngitis and genital lesions. Most commonly it is seen in children, infants and teenagers and it has a prodromal symptoms of 1 to 3 days before the, uh, I mean before the infections uh, gives rise to vesicles, there will be certain prodromal, prodromal symptoms which includes fever, malice, headache, patient will have loss of appetite, etc. And HSV primary infection is usually self-limiting even though a treatment is not uh, offered to the patient, it is usually self-limiting and it uh, extends only up to 10 to 14 days of time. Various other conditions in seen in the primary infection phase is keratitis, herpetic whitlow, vulvovaginitis, Balinitis. Oral lesions are most commonly seen in primary infection. The area of uh, infection in case of primary HSV is the keratinized mucosa, especially the palate, the gingiva and lip region are most commonly involved. Hence it is called as gingivostomatitis as it is the most common location. Secondly, pharynx is also involved giving rise to severe pharyngitis. At the primary infection stage, there will be at the site of inoculation, there will be multiple ulcers seen in the in one side and these ulcers will break giving rise to, uh, I mean these vesicles will break giving rise to uh, ulcers. These ulcers are usually of pinpoint size, uh, about 1 to 3 mm in size and later all these uh, ulcers will fuse to form a one big ulcer. 
I mean, if, uh, at multiple sides, there will be different big ulcers seen. These ulcers will have a irregular border. That is the pathognomic sign of the uh, HSV oral lesions. And usually seen on the vermilion border. And, uh, and in the next phases, they usually uh, have crustaceans and heal, spawn, heal after uh, the infection. At this stage also, normally uh, the lesions are infectious and they can be transmitted to children or any other uh, person who directly touches these lesions. At the gingiva region, these herpetic uh, lesions are usually very red, they are painful and difficulty in eating. Patient will have sore mouth and they, he or she will have difficulty in eating spicy foods and they will restrict to bland food. And usually these conditions uh, will be associated with fever or a prodromal fever uh, after which these ulcerations develop. Patient will also have difficulty in swallowing in case of uh, HSV pharyngitis. Coming to recurrent HSV infection, this recurrent HSV infection usually occurs uh, after a certain period of the primary infection. In certain conditions like immunocompromisation state, immunocompromised state or when patient is uh, directly exposed to ultraviolet rays uh, and if they have fever in case of menstruation, there can be sudden outbreak of this HSV infection which, is, which was actually latent in the neurotrophic, or in the neuronal cells or in the epithelial cells. If at all this HSV virus is present within the epithelial cells there, it will give rise to ulcers again. This uh, ulceration seen at the labial region is called as recurrent herpes labialis or a pathognomic feature called as cold sore is also seen. Other prodromal symptoms seen in case of recurrent HSV are burning, itching, tingling and uh, other sensations and also an extra neural latent HSV uh, along the sides of the dermatomes. The pathognomic feature is along the sign of the dermatome, this le the lesions will be seen. In HSV in immune compromised state is another atypical uh, ulcerating lesions can be seen and it will have a it will take an aggressive phase in this condition. It is usually indistinguishable from that of a recurrent aphthous stomatitis. The pathognomic sign of this HSV in immune compromised state is that they will have satellite ulcers seen along the uh, the main ulcer in, along the border of the main ulcer they will have a satellite ulcer seen. Coming to other complications, in case of disseminated HSV, multi-organ involvement can be seen. Another important complication is HSV encephalitis. It will have necrotizing and hemorrhaging encephalitis in this condition. Various investigations uh, that, that help us in identifying a HSV infection is that primarily the history, proper thorough history of the patient and the clinical features itself will give us a uh, a provisional diagnosis but then other investigations that will help us in uh, you know uh, coming to a final diagnosis is viral culture which is a gold standard and polymerase chain reaction of the CSF will also give us a uh, diagnosis. Zang smear is one of the uh, histopathological feature that can help us in identifying HSV. This Zang smear is usually taken uh, is usually done by collecting the fluid from the vesicle and it will be stained and uh, to see this Zang cells. Uh, then also another pathognomic feature in uh, histopathology is Lipschitz bodies where cowdry type A intranuclear inclusion bodies can be seen. Coming to the management, usually a symptomatic treatment has to be given to this patient. Patient has to be given lots of fluids and for fever they have to give they have to be given with uh, given a paracetamol or any antipyretics. If at all an antiviral therapy has to be started. This has to be started within 48 to 72 hours of primary infection. Acyclovir will inhibit the viral replication and usually 15 milligrams per kg uh, body weight uh, for about 5 times a day has to be given. For adults it is about 200 to 400 milligrams 4 to 5 times per day will help in preventing the, uh, the inhibiting the viral replication. And other uh, uh, recurrent herpes labialis uh, condition can also be prevented and by and by stopping this triggering factors which I already discussed. Coming to recurrent uh, treatment or management of this recurrent herpes labialis, acyclovir topical, 5% acyclovir top, topical cream can help in reducing that tingling sensation and it will help in faster healing and 3% pencyclovir, 10% docosanol can also be given. To prevent the recurrent attacks, about 200 to 400 milligram Acyclovir has to be given twice daily for about 6 to 12 months and after a 6 to 12 months drug free period. 
Even IV acyclovir is also available and this is the mainstay of treatment for HSV encephalitis. Thank you.